thank you all for being here. My name is Margaret Mueller. I'm the president and CEO of the Executives Club of Chicago. Welcome to Chicago's biggest business happy hour. <laughs> All right. When we were first throwing this idea around, it was a big, audacious goal, and uh, we pulled it off. It's really cool, but with the help of a lot of people who I want to thank. First, Tom Ricketts, your birthday yesterday. I hear that your team didn't throw you a birthday party, so we decided that we need to do this for you oh, for your birthday. birthday. So happy birthday. <laughs> All of your hosts here tonight share our mission of connecting and growing Chicago's business community. We all believe in Chicago, we're all in on Chicago, and we're here to celebrate all of you, the members of Chicago's business community, who are also working to connect and grow your teams and your companies here in Chicago. So thank you tonight as a celebration of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, we want to thank Chicago Cubs and Marquee Sports Network for generously sponsoring the event. They have provided the venue and the staff and the AV and the food and everything, so thank you. All right. And a special thank you to Anheuser-Busch, who has donated all of the beverages that you're drinking tonight as well. The Exec Club prides itself on being the nexus of Chicago's business community. We wanted to be inclusive in this event, and so we invited some other civic organizations to join us, so it wasn't just about us. So I want to acknowledge the co-hosts for this event and welcome all of their members here with us tonight. Montel Gales of the Business Leadership Council, Jack Lavin of the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce, Bobby Achetu of Entrepreneurs Organization Chicago, Jaime DePaulo of the Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Siri Hibbler of the Illinois Black Chamber of Commerce, and Michael Fasnacht of World Business Chicago. Thank you all for co-hosting this event. And that's it. We're going to have you know, a short program, and then we're all going to go out on the field for happy hour. And before that, I'd like to introduce Tom Ricketts, all right. uh, who's going to be introducing our guests tonight. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Margaret. And how about a round of applause for Margaret? What an incredible job she does. All right, so we got a pretty good crowd here. Has anyone been to Wrigley Field before? Oh, uh, that's, that, that's good. That's, that's pretty much everybody. How about who's been to Wrigley Field when it's empty like this? It's pretty cool, right? I mean, it looks great even when it's empty. That's how beautiful this ballpark is. But anyway, uh, it's really a great honor to uh, be able to introduce our, our speakers for tonight. Um, it's always an honor to introduce anyone at an executives club function, but uh, it's a special honor when uh, I consider the people on the stage here with me, friends and colleagues. Uh, I'll start with uh, Brendan Whitworth. He is the CEO of Anheuser-Busch US. He, uh, he's been with Anheuser since 2013 and had a number of jobs as he's risen up the ranks there. Uh, before that, he was a senior executive at Frito-Lay. Uh, before that, he uh, spent some time at the Harvard Business School. Never heard of it. But before that, he was in the uh, U.S. Marines. Thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. yeah, very and in the CIA and the counterterrorism division. Very much thank you for your service. So, um, so I know Brennan a bit. We've hung out a bit together because, as you might imagine, um, the Cubs and uh, Anheuser are, are somewhat partners. But you know, it, it's really personal for me with with Brennan because. Um, a few years ago, when we became the, the stewards of the club, uh, we had about 150-something corporate partners. So um, every, like every, there was several banks, and everybody had a little piece of Wrigley Field, a little sign here, a little ATM there. And we, we started thinking about that and said, you know, we'd rather do it differently. Let's, let's get bigger, deeper, more meaningful partnerships with um, the, 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 the brands and the companies that mean so much to us. And we, um, and we really leaned in to the partnership with Budweiser at that point and Anheuser. And, and it's been incredible. And, and a little side note, and maybe I'll get in trouble. Maybe Brennan will get the guy in trouble for maybe when I tell this story. But a few years ago, I built a house. And in my house, they put in taps. You know, cap, cap, tap kegs, you know, like, you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, great, just throw them in, sounds great, all cool guys have those, right? And then I realized later, I don't know what to do with that, I don't know where, I, it's been a long time since I've been in college, so I'm talking to uh, J.R. Hand, who's uh, with us today, our distributor, and um, he says, oh, call this guy, he'll come to your house, he'll set you all up, don't worry about, yeah, don't worry about a thing. So I call this guy up, and um, 
we pick my beers. Oh, I want a Bud Light. I want a Stella. I want a 312. And, um, and he's like, okay, when do you want a Mr. Ricketts? And I'm like, oh, look, I don't care. Whenever you can squeeze me in, I know I'm not the biggest customer, meaning my house. <laughs> and he goes, Mr. Ricketts, you're the number one outlet for Budweiser products in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, all right, tomorrow morning, 7 a.m., be there. <laughs> so anyway, so it's a, I'm very, very happy to introduce Brendan. And with him is another friend and colleague, Doug Glanville. Uh, many of you know Doug Glanville as a broadcaster on our, our channel and has been for many years. Uh, Doug's background is uh, he also has an Ivy League history. He went to Penn and played baseball. He was drafted in the first round by the Chicago Cubs, number 12. And... Um, you know, the 12th pick in last year's draft got a uh, $4.8 million <laughs> signing bonus. I'm sure it was about the same in 1991. Yeah. <laughs> in that range. In pennies, maybe in pennies. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah, in that range. So anyway, the, um, Doug went on to have a, uh, a great career in major leagues, nine years. In 1997, he, bat, he batted 300 for the Chicago Cubs. He had 4,000, nearly 4,000 at bats in the major leagues and 1,100, exactly 1,100 major league hits. But Doug, after his career has continued on, he's, uh, he's an accomplished author, and he's a, obviously a broadcaster with us, and, um, and he wrote a very acclaimed book about his experiences in Major League Baseball a few years ago. But on the personal note for me, you know, like a good decision we made to get closer to our partners like, like, like Anheuser, we also started our own channel our own network, the Marquee Network. And I saw Mike running around here who runs it. He does a brilliant job. But, but, the, but the best thing about having our network is we get to bring in the people we want to bring in to tell the message directly to our fans that we think they want to hear and inform them about our club and tell them what we're doing and really do anything we want from a, from a, uh, from, from like a, a content standpoint, from an artistic standpoint. And one of the things we did was um, talk to Doug about a show called Classes in Session. And what Doug does is about, it's a monthly show where Doug sits down and goes deep on an issue in a very, uh, very thoughtful, um, professorial kind of way with, um, with people that will speak on both sides of that issue. And um, in our first year of being eligible, um, Doug won us an Emmy for his show, Classes in Session. And it was, it was the episode about the 2021 All-Star Game, which you can imagine is a very fraught topic. So anyway, it's great to have both these guys up here. I'm sure they'll be uh, incredibly informative. And um, just let's give them one more round of applause and get them started. Thank you. All right. Am I up? Batter up? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. No, well, thanks so much for, uh, for coming out. And as you know, I was drafted by the Cubs. And my first year, I lived in the New York apartments over there, uh, right there. So I used to walk to the games, and nobody knew who I was since I was a rookie. So I could, I could get away with it. So a lot of memories. Two of my kids were born here in Chicago. So uh, it's a long, long standing history. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, well, as you were introduced, the CEO of Anheuser Busch, Brendan Whitworth. Uh, we got to know each other a little bit before uh, in the green room, just talking a little bit. And uh, so I, I think first I wanted to start off by, you know, you're not the first of Anheuser-Busch representatives that have engaged the executive club of Chicago, uh, previous CEO, Michelle Dukaris. And I'm curious now in this role now that you've transitioned into, uh, what it's been like and, and what are you excited about in terms of the future for Anheuser-Busch? Sure, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a great question. I, I understand that there was a, a virtual um, thing that you all did, I think last year, or a little bit further than a, a last year, where my predecessor, who also conveniently happens to be our global CEO, slash still my boss, um, <laughs> is uh, still very much a part of my life. And um, so it's been a little bit over a year. And it, you know, having come into the position, I had the benefit of joining the organization in 2013. So I did the, I did the military government stuff, had a quick stop in business school, did a, a few years at PepsiCo, and then found where I thought I belonged at Anheuser-Busch. So from 2013 forward, um, had an opportunity to work in different facets um, of the business. And so now having had the opportunity to take this position, um, I think it's really a, a privilege to 
now have an opportunity to influence even more uh, the direction of the organization and sort of look back on the experiences that I had in all those different roles and see how I can try to make us, make us better. Um, I think it's, what's also a privilege is, you know, I, uh, I don't think there's anything that is going to be in my life um, better than serving my country. Um, and I did that for eight years. And I made a decision to, to pivot um, after eight years. It wasn't necessarily pre-calculated. <laughs> I sort of made a sequence of decisions um, that took me out of government service and, and put me on a, a different trajectory in, in quote unquote business. Um, but you know, there's always this passion that still burns inside you uh, for what you saw as, as the highest calling. And uh, I felt kind of fortunate to land in a company that in my mind uh, is like one degree of separation from the US. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an institution that's been around for close to 170 years. Um, you take a lot of these iconic things that the company, some of our brands like Budweiser have meant over the years. And I still get a lot of that passion um, that drove me to government service kind of earlier in my life. So I think it's really a privilege to not only be able to try to steer this company because of the experiences I've had within it, but then as well, this privilege of still feeling like I'm close <laughs> to uh, something that's, that's important uh, for our country. Um, and then I think in terms of the, the business itself, you know, we, um, we set uh, a bit of a transformational strategy or agenda uh, back in 2017, where we wanted to take the, the pieces of our business that got us to, to there, make them better, and then start building components of the business around those things. Um, and so we've made a lot of progress over the last five years on that, on that, on that trajectory, on that business, um, or that strategy. So if you take something like Michelob Ultra, which conveniently many people have, even Bud Light and things like that, um, you know, Michelob Ultra over the last five years is double its size. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, there's components of our business that we didn't necessarily have before or have the capabilities to do, like uh, ready to drink cocktails. We have a great brand called Cutwater, kind of leads the, the industry in that space. We've launched other spirits-based products. Um, and so we constantly look at our brands, we look at our portfolio, we look at our capabilities and see what we're good at being able to do. Um, because just as you want to do something doesn't mean you're going to be good at doing it, nor do you have the capabilities in order to be able to do it. So that strategy, that trajectory was built around our capabilities, what we wanted to do, accelerating sort of what got us over the 170 years and what's really going to be important to build around that for the next 170 years. <laughs> so, you know, after one year in role, you know, my goal is to continue that, that transformation, that acceleration. And then kind of what gets me excited is the potential. Um, because even if I look back five years and I look at where we are now, we can do so much more. Um, and that's like things around innovation. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you think about innovation within the context of like a quote unquote new brand, um, like Cutwater or a new vodka seltzer that we have called Neutral that we launched a few months ago. But then there's also a lot of innovation that comes into how you do what you do. Um, not just the type of products that you choose to put out. So I think as an organization, when you think about how we've enabled our business technologically, um, analytically, I know those become catchphrases at times, but really we've worked to get better um, at how something like technology or something like analytics can help us make better decisions, make faster decisions, um, or kind of help make decisions for us because it's looking at things that you know human beings just simply don't have the bandwidth to look at or match things or consider things that human beings don't have the ability to do. Um, so I think really what gets me excited is that continued potential as we, we continue to step down this journey that we started over the last five years. And then the impact that I can have now in an expanded role on that potential, on that transformation and on that sort of forward part of the strategy. Well, and part of that is partnerships. You know, you think about, I always think of duos in some ways, about tandem, so, you know, chips and salsa, you know, Batman and Robin kind of combination. Now, you know, I'm gonna give a little insight. I would say Hall and Oates, so Hall and yeah, Oates fan yeah, out here. Yeah, All right, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Now, I'll jump. yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> now, undeniably, there's beer and baseball. I mean, yep. that is something that automatically it comes to mind. 
And, and just thinking about that relationship, like what have you done to focus on that partnership? Why is it so successful and sort of where do you want to take that part? Yeah, we, um, you know, we, as we look across you know, our, our portfolio of brands, right, we want to take a look at, and that's everything from Bud, Bud Light, Michelob Ultra, all the way up to Cutwater and to Goose Island and all these different pieces of our portfolio. Um, we want to place them in occasions where we can find consumers. Consumers that can have experiences with our brands um, and become attached to them. And so really when we, we look at how we, we manage our portfolio and we look at um, consumers and we look at occasions, we look at a variety of things. Um, and there's many new occasions that we try to have our brands be present in. But a tried and true occasion for our products and many of our, our historic brands are not only sports, but, but baseball. Um, and so when, when, when you're able to make that occasion um, even a bigger part of what you do, it's fantastic, right? You wanna double down on something that you're good at and then go expand into new things that might be incremental um, to what you do. So I think when you think about uh, our brands, Budweiser, Bud Light, Michelob Ultra, you think about the occasions that sports provide and baseball provides and the excitement and the passion that exists there. And then lo and behold, you can match that up with some of our brands. Um, that consumer goes away you know, with an experience that lasts. Um, and so I, I'm sure many folks here as, as Cubs fans or, or other sports fans um, have had experiences uh, with, with, with products and hopefully our products, and that lasts. I know I personally have throughout you know, my legal drinking age life, um, and, uh, and, and really that's what we want to make sure that we, that we do well at. And we have amazing partners, and I think right, Tom is at the top of the list in terms of amazing partners that we have the opportunity to work with, because we really want to make sure that, that these partnerships are rich, they're deep, um, and, and give a lot of benefit and opportunities for both sides of the partnership. Well, that was something you mentioned before is I, you know, Anhe the Budweiser passion came before Anheuser-Busch, not the other way around. Yeah. And I always appreciated that. And I know a lot of this relates to just another type of partnership, which is values. You share values with a community. And you talk about, you know, these places, these venues are in some of the great cities that we can think of. Mm -hmm. And these cities are built with the fabric of fans and families and vendors and all kinds of partnerships that make it come together. One of those partnerships revolves around the breweries yep. and, and sort of the makers, the creators in some respects. So I'm interested to understand like, how you encourage those breweries, those relationships, and how they connect to not only your vision for how they can impact and stay assets to the community, mm -hmm. but also to the planet and responsible. Sure, yeah, I think um, you know, we, we very much like to think of our business um, and what we do and our brands as local. 99% um, of what we sell here, we make here. Um, and that starts all the way back, um, even before the breweries. So it starts with our, um, our partners, our farming partners, how we, how we get the barley, how we get the hops, um, and the other products. So our partnership with communities even goes further back um, than just breweries. So once those uh, natural raw materials end up at our breweries, you know, you could either go to 12 of the larger Anheuser-Busch breweries, or you can go to over 20 of our local craft breweries like Goose Island, you know, just down the road from here. Um, so for us, you know, we appreciate um, and, and take responsibility for the role that our facilities, um, whether it be, and a facility could be kind of, you know, a malting facility that even exists before the brewery, or a rice mill that exists before the brewery um, as being important because, you know, fewer of our, of our breweries um, are in large cities, right? It's just the way that, you know, things, things work out for logistics footprints and things along those lines. So um, even more so than, you know, having a, having a, a production environment or uh, a facility that employs th thousands of people in a big city, it's even more important when you, when you do it in a place like Cartersville, Georgia. 
um, and then what that means uh, for the local for the local community, the employment, and then the way that that we can give back. Um, so that's very much ingrained in in what we do and who we are as an organization. It allows us to impact communities, um, you know, in New Hampshire, in Georgia in St. Louis, which is our hometown. Um, I know that's not a popular city uh, here, but that's okay. I, I've got, I, mean, I don't know if I have a, a dog in the fight. We have amazing partners with the Cubs, amazing partners with the Cardinals. I live in New York City, uh, but we also, we also have 2,000 amazing employees in St. Louis. Um, or, you know, across the board, Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Florida, Fairfield, California. So those, those are um, the, the communities that are special to us because those are, are our employees. And, and some of those communities were a very large employer um, for, for those folks. So that economic impact um, and then other things that we can do being a part of the community uh, is significant. And then you kind of asked about, I think, about the sustainability and uh, what we do. Um, we have, as Many com companies do, and really all companies should, uh, you know, ambitious sustainability goals, and then in that, uh, an agenda to get to those goals. So, you know, when we look at um, the impact that we have, um, we work a lot around renewable energy. Um, so sometimes that includes wind farms at our breweries. Sometimes that includes solar panels around our breweries, and they're not small. So you actually can get, you can, you can drop um, your energy consumption in the double digits on a percentage basis with the right solar fields on top of your breweries. Um, you know, we've invested in solar f f uh, farms in other, in other geographies such that, you know, we can kind of work across where we consume versus where other, where other energy is produced. Um, you know, beer is, beer is made with water. Um, you know, it's part of the it's part of the production process. Um, we we have many tactics in terms of minimizing our water consumption, and we track that diligently. Um, and even if you go further back, as I mentioned, the farmers, we work very deeply with um, you know our farming partners to make sure that they have smart agricultural practices. Um, they also are very conscientious of water usage. Um, and then you know we know that we make our we make our products in cardboard um, is how they get shipped. We really don't deal with plastic, so that's not, so, not something that's part of our business. Um, we make sure that we, we recycle aluminum and make sure we're, we're active in that. And um, what's kind of cool about what we do, because it's not only what we try to do within our own facilities, um, we also know that we are a consumer company. Um, we try to get, you know, every day Americans to to buy our products. So we have a, an ability to connect with millions of people um, and, and that's how we kind of have driven our brands over the years. And so what we try to do is also bring other very critical things like recycling and awareness to, uh, to, to that connection. Because once a consumer finishes you know, a, an amazing Budweiser, they can immediately become a recycler if they're aware. Um, and so we also partner with folks like our sports partners. And a great example of that is we have this thing called the National Recycling League, where we partner um, with, some of our, with some of our sports teams. They do competition against each other. We uh, evaluate, weigh, measure how much of the products were sold at that game, get recycled, and then they compete. And then there's winners, as there should be in all games of sports. That's great. So it's just a way that we can use our consumer connection capability to not only you know, hopefully predispose consumers to our brands, but then as well drive home other messages. Yeah. All right, and we can't get hit by a foul ball here, right? We're okay. No, we got nets, okay. we're good, Just we're good. Um, you know, so with that type of footprint, and you talk about Anheuser-Busch everywhere worldwide, but through sports certainly, you also have diverse communities amongst these groups. And what I loved about baseball, you know, I grew up in a town that voluntarily desegregated in the 60s, and it was a passion of our community to learn from all kinds of people. And, then, and when I think about Major League Baseball, I go back to walking in spring training into the locker room and seeing people from all walks of life, all different communities, trying to figure out how to pull in the same direction. Uh, it, was, it was very inspirational. And I think when you think about having diverse groups of people in, in a clubhouse, you also think about a sport that you're trying to uplift 
because equity is centered to that because you want to make sure the rules are fair and fairly distributed amongst everyone. But you also want to include everybody on the team because everybody had a role. Everybody was important. And you're, you're the best version of yourself when you open your arms wider to include everybody. So I'm interested to know what Anheuser-Busch has done to expand and where their passion lies in terms of advancing the real purpose behind diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sure, yeah. Um, I think you can look at it uh, from, from two different ways, but there's one kind of one kind of main main thing um, in addition to just simply being the the, the right thing to do um, you know we uh, we sell our products our brands um, kind of in if it has an account that has a license to sell alcohol every square mile of the United States um, every community there's over 500,000 um, licensed accounts in the United States that sell our products. Um, those are in every community. Um, and so our consumer base is the United States of America and the US is diverse. And um, you know we have to strive to reflect that because those are our consumers. Um, so we, we try to do that inside our own organization and how we hire um, at different levels of the organization. Um, so that the people that are helping market or sell or do other facets of the business are reflective of the diversity of our country. Um, and then as well, we also understand that similarly to the, the National Recycling League, um, there are roles for brands to play yeah. at, at, at the appropriate level. Um, and so we think and talk about that a lot and we as well think we do um, a fairly decent job in, in leveraging that same capability about the National Recycling League to not only do things, but then also generate, um, generate awareness of the topic. So if you take uh, Bush Light, right? Bush Light's an amazing brand, um, growing like crazy. It's got its center um, sort of in the heartland Midwest of America. Who knows, who Bush, who knows what Bush Light is? <laughs> Raise your hands, yes, thank you very much. Um, and Bush Light's, one of Bush Light's things that it does is NASCAR. And, and so it has leaned into um, female drivers and supporting female NASCAR drivers. Uh, Michelob Ultra, right? I saw some Michelob Ultras out there. Anybody have a Michelob Ultra in their hand? Yeah, very good, thank you very much. Uh, double the size that it was five years ago and the second, second largest beer brand in the United States behind Bush Light, or Bud Light. Um, but that, uh, that brand, and we have donated uh, $100 million behind gender equality in sports so that we can continue to advance that, um, that, that agenda. So I think it really comes down to what's an appropriate way for a beer brand to generate awareness um, and then do it. Yep. So we really, our consumers are diverse, we have to make sure that our employee workforce is diverse, and then our brands have to do an appropriate level of things because we have that capability to do it. Well, you think about Major League Baseball, we talked about that kind of partnership. And recently, Major League Baseball announced that they were changing some rules, right? So I'd love the fan participation here. So three yeah. major rules have been adopted <laughs> for 2023, right? One is the pitch clock, all right? Pitch clock? What is everybody? Yeah. Pitch clock. All right, you know, kind of lukewarm. <laughs> all right, they're banning the shift, shifting defense. All right, you know, all right, it's kind of 50-50 yeah. <laughs> And of course, the one that just is riveting, but they're making the bases bigger. What? <laughs> they're making the bases bigger? Yeah, making a little bit. Now, look, I didn't know that. Well, I stole bases for yeah, a living, yeah, so that's kind of good. That's yeah. kind of good. You know, that extra three inches. Wow. That's the difference between safe and out. Yeah. So, but baseball has taken the steps because they're constantly getting feedback from their audience, their mm -hmm. fan bases and they're pushing to figure out what is exciting. They want every generation to have a footprint, a fingerprint on where they're going. And so they're responsive, and that's part of the relatability that they, rec they rec rely on and require. Totally. So in thinking through how baseball has tried to adapt in these ways, I'm curious about your point of view of, on innovation, because you mentioned the stalwart products. You have so many of them, right? Yeah. Budweiser, Bud Light, Michelob Ultra, for example. And we know those are mainstays, but you also have to continue to evolve yep. to respond to your consumers. So what has that been like to sort of approach that and, and sort of what are those initiatives that you're looking at? Sure, yeah, I think um, you know, underneath the, 
sort of the umbrella of quote unquote innovation. Um, you know, the company, the company uh, Anheuser-Busch has been here for 170 years because innovation is core to kind of who we are and what we do, right? Innovation back in the day used to be like refrigerated rail cars, <laughs> which helped yeah. to get more broader distribution of Budweiser as an example. So I think that has been in the fabric um, of, of the company for years. And, um, and even more so uh, today, we just try to build and get, get bigger and better um, at being able to make the, the right decisions for the company. Um, you know, I mentioned the, the what, like the products, right? So I think when it starts with the what of innovation, we have to understand not only what the consumers are looking for today, um, what are their barriers for some products that are available right now, um, and, and then how we, can, how we can design products or brands that fit um, some of the, that get around some of those barriers and, and land where uh, the consumer, what the consumer wants. Um, and sometimes they'll tell you, right, we study consumers all the time, constantly, thousands and thousands and thousands, all demographics, all geographies. Um, sometimes they'll tell you, or enough of them will tell you where you can just, you can figure it out. But sometimes you have to kind of almost lead them there if you can stitch together um, enough insights that you think are meaningful that you can make a bet on putting a product in a particular space and see if, to use a baseball analogy, right? You know, if you build it, they will come. Um, and you put it there and see if, they'll, see if they'll come. So I think we're constantly doing that. Um, sometimes we do innovation and we go very large with it. We're probably doing less of that today than we used to do. Uh, we used to go, here's the brand, here's the Super Bowl commercial, and it's gonna be available in 90% of accounts within the first four weeks. Um, and you take a lot of risk when you do that, uh, because with that type of mobilization comes a lot of investment you have to put behind it. If it doesn't work, then essentially that investment uh, could have been used elsewhere. So we, we put together uh, a number of smaller things, put them actually out into the market where consumers um, essentially make decisions with their dollars. Because when you study them, they tell you what they think. And when you make it available, and you let them know it's there, then they vote with their dollars. Right. Then you can start making things that are originally smaller, bigger. And so you start expanding them geographically. Um, so that's constantly what we do. But what we do has to fit our capabilities, right? So just because, I don't know, a particular thing is, or a particular segment that has alcohol in it um, is quote unquote on fire, doesn't mean we're well equipped to go do it. Um, because you know, there's nothing in my in our production facilities that says you know we can bottle big bottle spirits, right? We're just not good at it. Um, but we can. We literally put we fill 52 million of these a day. Yeah. So whether this has Bush Light in it, right. uh, Budweiser in it, or whether that has a Cutwater canned cocktail in it that's made with spirits instead of brewed. We can do that. <laughs> right. um, and if it's available in accounts where our distribution system goes, we can distribute that. So we really kind of design what we do innovation-wise to fit our capabilities. So that's all the what, and then I mentioned the how before. It's just how we enable our business. Um, you know, we, another, some other catchphrases, we use AIML, right? So artificial intelligence, machine learning. All that says is, I mentioned there are 500,000 accounts that sell our products across the United States. We know exactly what's sold in all 500,000 accounts, in what ratios, what frequencies, whether it's growing, whether it's declining. That's impossible for a human to analyze. So we sort of hand that over to the machines and we, t we allow them to come back to us and say, what's working the best where and why? And then we can start distilling insights from there. So those, those, the what and the how all fit underneath kind of the, the umbrella of being more innovative. Now I have an idea for you. Yep. All right. I'm not going to require you to sign an NDA. Okay. okay. This is yep. money. You want to whisper it? All right. Could, yeah. So we mentioned <laughs> beer and baseball. Yep. What if you had a beer that tastes like a baseball? <laughs> and I'm going to call it Good. Budweiser Rawhide. I like it. Bud R. I like it. A but, I'm a but, do I look like a Bud R man? I think you, uh, yes. Okay. Do you want it to be uh, on the finish or right up at the front of the sip? What? So it's like a beer and it finishes with rawhide or it's right there from the beginning on the tip of the tongue? That's a good, I haven't thought of that through. Yeah, this is, this is what we think about because there's different, there's different taste experiences as you go through the consumption moment. So yeah, we have to work on that. All right, we'll, we'll talk. Okay, yeah. <laughs> 
So now, now we're in Wrigley Field. Okay, this is amazing. <laughs> and I came up a Cub, and I always think about the seventh inning stretch, right? Yep. Harry Carey, may he rest in peace. Harry Carey did the seventh inning stretch like no one. And that's a tradition. That's, that was around at a long time, and every team has their own rendition of it. And, and so when I think about it, I always think about that kind of partnership. But there's something else that's come from the seventh inning stretch throughout the cultural changes around responsible drinking, right? So, so the tap ends, you say bye to the beer vendor, you move on, and there's a moment of a couple of innings where there's no consumption. So it sounds sometimes antithetical saying, hey, sell less product. Mm -hmm. But I'm interested in why is it important to Anheuser-Busch to really invest heavily on the importance of responsible drinking? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great topic, it's a great question. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're obviously known as a, a very large, traditionally understood as a beer company, although we do as many different types of products. Um, but beer is really what, what is our core and center focus. But we're also kind of the largest alcohol company, right? And um, responsible drinking is, it's, it's, uh, it's absolutely what is part of what we do and, and really has been part of what we do uh, for a very, very long time. Um, and if you go back, even over the last decade, uh, us, along with our wholesaler partners, um, have, have put a billion dollars behind uh, responsible drinking. Um, and if you go even back, and I hope hopefully some of this resonates, uh, know when to say when, that campaign, and then how we can generate that, that type of awareness. Um, but then even though that commitment and some of those programs have been around for a very long time, you know, we continue to try to be innovative in how we bring that message home as more sort of ways to be innovative present themselves. So um, we, have, we have a more recent program called Decide to Ride. It's with Mothers Against Drunk Driving. It's in partnership with Uber. Because guess what? You can call a car yeah. to take you home. Um, and so that's a, that's a capability that, that we need to use as part of our responsible um, drinking agenda. But it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's right in step with who we are as a company and really has been for an extremely long time. Well, one thing I also connect, I think about duos I mentioned earlier, and uh, baseball and some semblance of relatability, right? The, the idea that you have phrases that say, let's have a beer, let's grab a beer. There's yep. something about it that comes to the table and there's social engagement, there's problem solving. I mean, it's, it's the center often of these conversations yep. about how people socialize. Yep. And so as the CEO of Anheuser-Busch, I'm curious about any stories you have that are memorable where you had a beer, you addressed the conversation, and it became an indelible part of who you are. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think there's like, uh, there's a whole lot, right? Um, <laughs> a whole bunch. Uh, I think one that, one that might stand out is, um, so this was actually, you know, I've, I've lived in the United States a long time. I've lived in other countries at different times, but this was actually uh, during, during a vacation. Um, I was in Mexico. Um, I was with my now wife. She was not the wife at the time, not my wife at the time. Um, and uh, I decided that uh, I was gonna propose. <laughs> so we were down on a, on a vacation, and I, this was previously after telling her I'm never gonna get married. <laughs> oh, no. To which she either honestly or calculatingly said, <laughs> okay. Um, so I thought this was like a big surprise, right? It wasn't like a, it wasn't like a predetermined moment whatsoever. So we're sitting on the beach all day, um, and uh, I finally, like, and it, it wasn't easy, right? I mean, anybody that's, <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. Not easy. Um, and so uh, towards the end of the day, I ordered a bucket of Montejos, <laughs> which is a brand we sell in California, but it also is a brand available. It's a Mexican brand, but um, it's, it's in, I still have the picture of it. Uh, it's available in Mexico. So that helped me along the process. Um, and uh, after a couple Montejos, kind of reached into the, the bag with the towels and then went for it. So um, yeah, now I have a six, we have a six-year-old, we have a three-year-old. So I think that that's, uh, that's a, a moment that helped me make a decision or have a conversation <laughs> that uh, is still meaningful to me today. So yeah. Well, you're gonna have to open up like a letter to the editor on stories like that of, of people who have 
uh, proposed yeah. <laughs> through your yeah. product. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. I think it's a good campaign. We could use that. Actually, yeah. <laughs> yep. Budweiser Rawhide. That's it. That's it. <laughs> So I can't, we got, I just like, two, th two ideas coming out of this. We can work on the way home. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's get it yeah. down. Well, well, Brendan, it's been a pleasure to sit with Thanks, you. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate and, um, it. I want to thank the CEO of Anheuser Busch, Brendan Whitworth, on the insights. Uh, so, thank you so much for your time and you. all your hard work. I'm Doug Glanville, and uh, Wrigley Field can't beat it. Yeah. All right. Thank you.